Hi, I'm Robert Costanza. I'm director of the Institute for Sustainable Solutions at Portland State University. I'm going to tell you a little bit today about a report that we just did on planning approaches for water resources development in the lower Mekong Basin. Some background on the planning process that the Mekong River uh, Commission, uh, or MRC, has been involved with. Uh, the MRC was mandated in, this, uh, in its forming agreement in 1995 uh, to develop a Basin Management Plan, or BDP. Um, and the idea behind this is to promote some coordinated development and management of all of the water-related resources in the basin. Uh, the first phase of this planning process was in 2001 to 2006. That was the BDP-1. Second phase is 2007 to 2010, recently completed BDP-2. The scenarios that were uh, investigated in this uh, BDP-2 process uh, were formulated um, and forwarded by each of the countries uh, involved, and they, they mainly had to do with hydropower development and water resources development in the, uh, in the lower basin. Um, <clears throat> there are multiple uses, however, that, uh, including hydropower, so there's irrigation and floodplain management as well. The assessment of these scenarios um, was, uh, was part of a, uh, a dialogue process in developing a, uh, the, the, the basin development strategy uh, for the lower uh, Mekong Basin, which is uh, negotiated by all the member countries. So as part of this process, uh, there was the um, evaluation of uh, 11 dams that were proposed on the mainstream uh, of, the, of the Mekong, which are shown in, in, as the red dots in this, in this diagram. So the BDP-2 looked at several different scenarios for the construction of these dams, and we evaluated a, uh, a few of those, a few representative of those scenarios that represented the midpoint, uh, perhaps, and the, uh, and the end point. Um, so in addition to the BDP-2, there was a Strategic Environmental Assessment, or SEA, of this proposed uh, string of dams. Uh, this was commissioned as a consultant's report. Uh, and looked at the potential environmental impacts. Um, these two reports are intended to complement each other and provide a basis for joint understanding. And both had extensive public consultation, which helped to get the views of a wide range of stakeholders into the process. They are among the key planning tools that the MRC uh, uses to make decisions about the Lower Mekong Basin. And while they provided some valuable inputs, um, it was felt that uh, some additional analyses of several key areas uh, could, could help uh, in this process. In particular, we thought that uh, additional sensitivity analysis of this cost-benefit uh, analysis that was done on these um, scenarios for dam development was particularly important to look at. And, and let me stress that in, in doing that, we're not making any recommendations about um, whether dams should be built or not. Uh, we're simply looking at what is the sensitivity of the conclusions uh, to some of the underlying assumptions that went into that analysis, recognizing that there's a huge amount of uncertainty in, uh, in all of these assumptions and they affect the conclusions. Um, in particular, we looked at the valuation of ecosystem services, uh, including the, uh, the uh, provisioning services of fisheries and, uh, and the uh, regulatory and other services of wetlands in the, um, in the lower basin. And we looked at some of the social impacts that, that could, um, could result and the distribution of benefits and costs of the proposed developments. So it was, um, the idea was to provide some guidance uh, to how the, the Mekong River Commission planning efforts can go forward, continue to evolve and improve and do, and do a better integrated version in the future. This is uh, an evolving planning process. It's not, the idea is not to do uh, one plan or one evaluation and stop, but to constantly improve things as we go forward. So the main report assessment looks at how to better deal with risk, uncertainty, and, uh, and discounting the future. Uh, so in, as part of that, the sensitivity analysis that we talked about is, uh, is, uh, is a main element. Uh, we also did a review of the changes in fisheries uh, that might result uh, from uh, these uh, development plans in the, in the basin, um, including the mainstream hydropower developments and how they could influence the costs and, and benefits of the different scenarios. We did a review of the, the methods to internalize the value of ecosystem services currently being provided and, um, and how these estimates might change. Um, under different development scenarios. And we made some suggestions about how to better integrate 
and model all of these elements uh, going forward. So our key report findings include uh, first this uh, assessment of the sensitivity of the benefit costs uh, analysis to, uh, to different assumptions. And our intention there was to, to establish more of a range of uncertainty. And to do that, uh, we changed the, the discount rate that was used from 10% uh, uh, to include also a 3% and a 1% dis discount rate, rates that might be more appropriate for different parts of the, of the project, uh, in particular the natural capital components. Um, we changed the assumption about the value of loss capture fisheries to, uh, from 80 cents per kilogram to $3 per kilogram, which we thought was a better uh, range of uncertainty. Um, we changed the assumption about the ability of aquaculture to replace capture fisheries from uh, assuming that it could replace almost all of the, that loss to assuming that it could only replace about 10% of the loss. And finally, we, we changed the assumption about the value of uh, wetland ecosystem services from uh, $1,200 per hectare per year to $3,000 uh, per hectare per year. And that, that included a whole range of things, including uh, flood protection and, and water regulation, et cetera, recreational values. Uh, together, if you put all of these changes in the assumptions together at the extreme uh, ends, uh, you, you move the... Uh, results from a positive $33 billion to a negative $274 billion. Uh, so there's quite a range of uncertainty that, we, that we've established there. Uh, part of the issue here is uh, this idea of discounting. The, the results are highly sensitive to which discount rate is, uh, is assumed. And this slide just gives a little background about how much difference that can make in, in general. Um, this graph or this table shows the results uh, of our sensitivity analysis. Uh, the, the, the yellow uh, rows in this, in this uh, table show the, um, the alternative results, and they're just below the standard results for the, uh, uh, for the study that was done uh, in the BDP2. So it quickly gives you an idea of what uh, the, the, the range of differences that occur uh, for three different scenarios. Uh, the three scenarios are the three sort of groups of, of columns in this, uh, in this table. Uh, the first one's called the definite future scenario, where the dams that are already being planned on the uh, tributaries of the, of the Mekong uh, continue to go forward. Uh, the middle one is what we call the six dam scenario, which, uh, which includes the six mainstream dams plus, uh, plus several other things happening. And the final one is the 11 dam scenario, if they build the full uh, all, all of the 11 dams that are being planned for the mainstream, plus, plus several other things, and also include the impacts of, uh, of climate change uh, on these. As I said, the BDP2 included a, a whole, whole range of other scenarios that are, that are uh, somewhat intermediate from these, but we, we thought that these three uh, sort of set the, uh, the range for, uh, for, for what was being looked at. This, uh, this slide shows graphically um, the, uh, the overall results. Uh, the blue are the original uh, NPV estimates in the BDP2, and the, the red are the, uh, uh, the revisions that we, we came up with to sort of set the range. So you can think of this as setting the range of possible answers uh, to this question of uh, what's the net present value of the, of the scenarios that were being looked at um, at the three different discount rates that we talked about. Uh, so for each of those blocks of columns, you see the definite future, the 6 dam, the 11 dam scenario at the 10% discount rate. You can see that in that case, uh, the results are still positive, but um, the red bars are much lower than, um, than the, the blue bars. And uh, <clears throat> as you go forward and change the discount rate to 3% and 1%, you can see that the results, uh, the, red, the red bars begin to become quite negative. And in the 11 uh, damp scenario, uh, they in, in all, it, the, at the 1% discount rate, uh, they're uh, negative uh, for all three of the scenarios going forward. If you look in a little more detail at the um, uh, economic impacts of the different components of these studies, so these are this, uh, this slide shows all of the different elements of, uh, of each study, including uh, navigation, losses in, in uh, bank erosion areas, etc., uh, down through um, losses in capture fisheries and uh, aquaculture and changes in, in wetlands, etc. Um, and the bottom set of uh, uh, bars is the hydropower generated. So that's, 
that's obviously a positive thing, and there are several other positive things in this, uh, in this spectrum. What we're doing is adding up all of those positives and negatives to get the, uh, the, the net effect. And you can see at the 10% discount rate, there's still a, a positive net effect in all three scenarios, um, even though there are negative effects on, uh, on capture fisheries and, uh, and, and wetlands. Uh, if you go to a 3% discount rate, you can see that those negative effects begin to outweigh the positive effects, and the, the net effect overall is, uh, is, becomes negative. And if you go to a 1% discount rate, uh, that negative effect is, uh, is even more. So the key recommendations that, uh, that, that we put forward coming out of this study is, first of all, that a more comprehensive, more integrated treatment of human, the human system and the natural system in this basin is really um, called for, and we need a more adaptive uh, approach to, to management. Um, uh, the, the process needs to include um, more sophisticated uh, modeling of the dynamics, the spatial patterns, the distribution of costs and benefits uh, to all of the various stakeholders. Uh, so building this more integrated assessment, I think, is, uh, is needed. Uh, within that, a more comprehensive analysis and treatment of risk and uncertainty. Um, so uh, how do we do a better sensitivity analysis, not only on the things that we've looked at so far, but I think on, on several other things that were not, not looked at yet. And how do we distribute that uncertainty? Who bears the, the, uh, the burden uh, for, for that uncertainty? Um, and one could argue that uh, that burden should not be borne by the, the general public, but should be borne by the parties that stand to gain from, from the activity. Uh, in the case of uh, dam developers, uh, one alternative would be to require them to post a, an assurance bond that would cover uh, the worst case damages. And then the uncertainty about those damages is borne by that bond. If the damages don't occur, they could recover the bond. If they do occur, uh, then those, uh, reven those, those funds could be used to, to mitigate the damages. But in general, it's a way of, of uh, requiring uh, the developers to bear the financial risk of the uncertainty that we know is quite significant in these, uh, in these cases. Um, we need a more thorough assessment of the value of ecosystem services, both directly and indirectly. Uh, we know that these services contribute significantly uh, to the uh, human well-being uh, in the region, and we need to do a much better job of properly valuing them. We need to look at a broader set of scenarios that, that, uh, that embody the full range of um, ideas about, about development. The current set of scenarios are firmly within the business as usual. Uh, sort of future, but we know that, um, as it's been said, you know, business as usual is really the utopian fantasy in the world we live in today. Uh, so we need to look at alternative futures and this idea of scenario planning where a, uh, a group of stakeholders is brought together to say what are some plausible futures in the region, uh, not what we think will happen, but what are, what are some possibilities, and then use that as a, as a tool for dialogue and discussion about what some preferred futures might be and how we might get there. And I think that needs to, to get beyond the standard ideas about, uh, about development that focus uh, largely on conventional economic growth, uh, but ones that can adequately bring in uh, other cont contributions, other contributors to human well-being, like ecosystem services and natural capital, like social capital. They're generally left out of the, the conventional um, accounting frameworks. Um, and finally, we need a better treatment of the effects of dam construction on local cultures and, uh, and the poor. Uh, what are the distribution of, of benefits and how can we uh, prevent or mitigate uh, or minimize those, uh, uh, those effects so that, so that everyone in the region can, uh, can benefit from the, from the development process. So the need for many of these steps was recognized uh, in the BDP2. So there's, I think, some, some general recognition that this is a direction that we need to go with and uh, it's consistent with and builds on uh, what they've, uh, they've already done and released in their integrated water resource management uh, uh, strategy. Uh, so that um, uh, we hope that this study uh, can contribute to that process and sort of can help um, move, move forward to, to uh, improve the, the, the lives, the sustainable well-being uh, of, uh, of everyone in the, uh, in the lower Mekong Basin. Thank you very much.